We are begin- going to be continuing in our sermon series that we began uh, at the beginning of the summer called The Big Picture. And what we've been doing in this sermon series is looking at how Scripture gives us this big picture or what we call meta-narrative of God's work from the beginning to the end of human history through the uh, repeated themes of covenants. And I've said this every time. There's different ways you can do this, different um, approaches. We're using covenants as a a way because it um, that's honestly one of the languages that the, the Bible itself uses, and it, it hits kind of the major events of Scripture and, and puts them together. Um, in, in the weeks that have passed, we have talk, talked about these several covenants. We've talked about the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve. We've talked about the covenant God made with Noah, uh, with Abraham, with uh, uh, with Moses and the Israelites, and then with David. Uh, and then a couple weeks ago, we talked about the, um, the promise of something new, um, the idea that in, uh, through the prophet Jeremiah and the prophets of the Old Testament, God promised to establish a new covenant that would be different than the Old Covenant. And um, that's kind of where we left off. And normally I'd break down like this is what each of those covenants just in review are about. But because of what, um, how we're going to be looking at this today, I'm not going to do that because we're going to be talking about that more in depth a little bit later. So as we've gone through this, I've also made a point to say I want to get us from where we left off in Scripture to where we're going to. And this is our first week in the New Testament. So I'm going to take us um, in, a, in a very whirlwind, very quick uh, history jaunt from basically the time of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah where we left off in the Babylonian captivity to the end of the Old Testament. And then we're going to look up at from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament in what is called the intertestamental period. And I want us to see how um, all the pieces of Scripture and pieces of history are falling into place getting us to Jesus. So we're going to pray and then we're going to dive into this uh, God's word for us today. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you are a God who makes and keeps his promises. Lord, we need you to show us how Jesus fulfills those promises, how all of your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. Open your word to us today. Speak to us through your spirit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Now, to remind you, the last thing we talked about was um, the Babylonian captivity. That is, when the, the Babylonian Empire came in, swooped down as an act of judgment from God, um, that God spoke through the prophets and warned the Israelites, this is going to happen, and a bunch of Israel was carried away into captivity into Babylon. That took place, um, uh, Jeremiah was prophesying 600-ish B.C., more or less. Um, so the Babylonian Empire actually fell to the Persian king, Cyrus, and that Persian king, who, this was prophesied by God as well, um, by the way, uh, he allowed Israelites to return to the land in about 538 B.C. And some of them did, while others stayed dispersed throughout the ancient Near East. a and by the way, if you read that in biblical literature or uh, things about the Bible, history, A-N-E is ancient Near East. That would be the regions surrounding the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So that would be southern Europe, um, the western part of, well, basically all of the Middle East and North Africa. Um, And the the Middle East would also include the areas of modern-day Iran and Iraq, um, which was Babylon, Persia, um, the Assyrian Empire. That was all in that region. So the Assyrian Empire falls to the, the... to the Persians, um, and some Jews came home. They all were allowed to, but some of them decided to stay dispersed. Uh, This this is called, known as the diaspora. This was still going on in in Jesus' day and continues to this day, that Jews were spread all throughout the world. Um, And God actually kind of said that was part of his plan. Uh, 
Then after that, uh, Ezra, who's a priest, my son Ezra's here, but he's downstairs, so he's not hearing this. He'd be like, Ezra, that's me. Uh, he led the rebuilding of the temple uh, starting around 515 BC. There are questions about where these dates land. I'm, I'm giving you a rough estimate here. And then the, the events of the book of Esther take place around 479 BC. And then Nehemiah leads the building, rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem in 444 BC. So um, kind of that's a big, we're jumping decades here. Um, and re realize Jeremiah, or Nehemiah did not rebuild the city of Jerusalem. He helped rebuild the walls to defend the city. The city was already there. The temple had already been um, reestablished. There is questions, by the way, about what, and this, we don't know the answer to this, about whether God's presence was in this second temple in the same way that it was in the first temple. Um, there is no biblical story of, of the presence of God descending on the temple in a cloud like it did the first temple or the tabernacle. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't there. We, we don't know. Um, we don't know. Um, then the prophets Joel, Haggai, and Malachi minister in what is called the post-exilic era. That is the era after the Babylonian exile, um, ending around 430 B.C. And by the way, the rest of the prophets um, have all been doing their ministry either during the Assyri uh, leading up to the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, or during the, um, the, cap the exile. The, there's exilic prophets, like Daniel is an exilic prophet. He, he was actually prophesying and doing his ministry not in Israel but in Babylon um, and actually in Persia. Um, uh, King Cyrus is mentioned by name in, in the book of Daniel. And this actually ends the writing of the Old Testament. So literally, we have gone through, like, historically, we've bridged all of the history from creation to the end of the writing of the last book of the Old Testament, which is the book of Malachi, which is the last book that would have been written during the Old Testament era. Um, and Joel, Haggai, and Malachi, along with a lot of the other prophets, as they wrote, were looking forward to what God was going to do in the more distant future. And so we, we're covering, that's the, in a sense, we've, we've big picture, that's the sweep of the Old Testament. Uh, and, and then if we just say, well, let's just start with the New Testament, the problem is there's about a 430-year gap between the end of the Old Testament and the first events recorded in the New Testament. There is four centuries, at least, that are not talked about in the pages of Scripture. It is actually kind of important that we understand the history of what was going on during that time to make sense of the events of the New Testament. The, uh, we're going to talk about this in, in, in more depth, but the, the Old Testament is our book, but we have a different relationship with, with it than we do the New Testament, and we should because, as we're going to talk about, we're not under the Old Testament anymore. We're not under that covenant anymore. So what was going on from the end of the writing of Malachi to the birth of Jesus? Well, the first thing that happens is the Persian Empire that was in control, uh, they ruled over the region of Israel from about 539 to 533 B.C., not a very long time. And then the Greeks, or I'm sorry, 333 B.C., so actually quite a long time, 200 years. But then the Greeks took over Israel in 333 B.C. They were first actually conquered as part of a movement uh, the, the conquest of the ancient world by a guy named Alexander. You guys ever heard of him? Yeah, he was pretty great, I guess, if you want to call him that. Alexander the Great, uh, the, the, the uh, Greek general who united the Greek people, and uh, he was actually technically Macedonian, but he overtook Greece and all of the ancient world, uh, and he, he took over the world. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. Alexander was in his early 30s, around 33 years old, uh, when he finished conquering the ancient world. And he died at that age without an heir. He had no children. And so this crazy thing happened. His four main generals started fighting among themselves about who got to take control of the empire. And they split the empire into four groups. I'll be honest, I, I have to look up what the names of two of the generals were because they don't interact with biblical history at all. 
but the two that um, the two that do are Potomi and Seleucid, and they are they produce their own empires, the Potomac and Seleucid empires, and they throughout history uh, fought over Israel, and, and Israel exchanged hands between them multiple times throughout the reign of the Greeks over that part of the world. Um, when we hear names like uh, Cleopatra, like there's lots of Cleopatras, but the one that we know of, like Mark Antony and Cleopatra, she was a Ptolemy. Um, if you don't know this, she, she ruled Egypt, right? The Ptolemies ruled Egypt. Cleopatra was Greek, not Egyptian. And she, but she, her people, uh, she ruled Egypt during this time. And these, these, there was constant strife and conflict over Israel because of its, its strategic location. So the Ptolemies and Seleucids went back and forth multiple times. And finally, um, a Seleucid uh, general, or uh, uh, emperor rather, um, named Antiochus IV Epiphanes uh, in 167 BC, uh, his, he named himself Epiphanes. If you don't know what this means, Epiphany means when you have seen me, you have seen God. He named himself that. He had a little bit of an ego. He thought he was a god. And so um, the Jewish people of Israel kept kind of butting heads with him and to kind of quell that, he went into the temple, he set up an altar, and he sacrificed a pig upon it. Um, there's different stories that might have been to Zeus. It was probably to himself, but he, he sacrificed a pig on the altar, which desecrated the temple. This is the event that the prophet Daniel referred to as the, the abomination that caused desolation. Um, uh, there is no historical debate about that. It's possible that that event will happen multiple times throughout history because that event has already happened multiple times throughout history. It's happened three times already where somebody's gone into the temple and declared themselves to be a god or to worship or to, to clear the temple for some other god and done something like this. The first guy to do it was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Needless to say, the Jews of the time were like, nope, not having this, and they revolted in what is known as the Maccabean Revolt. There was no holiday armadillos involved, but the Maccabean Revolt is the event that led to what is known as Hanukkah, uh, which was an intertestamental uh, time of the cleansing of the temple. It was led by a, a family, and one of the guys that led it um, was named Judas Maccabee, and Maccabee means the hammer. This guy came in, and they did guerrilla warfare against the Greek army. So they would, they would like come out of the, the hillsides and just ambush the army, kill them, and run off. And they didn't know where they went because the people knew the area, and they didn't. So very much like what happened with the Revolutionary War in the United States. Um, and they, and they, they set up their own kingdom, actually. They, um, they were known as the Hasmoneans. And they were a Levite family, so they were a priestly family. And they actually set up their own semi-independent Jewish kingdom from 167 to, one, uh, to 63 BC. Um, and the, the family that kind of led the revolt wound up saying, we're going to lead Israel now. And they often served as both high priests and kings, which if you know anything about the Old Testament, and we've talked about the Davidic covenant, this is a no-no. They were not supposed to do that, but they did it anyway. And there was a lot of strife and a lot of killing one of one another. It was not a great time, but they were a semi-independent Jewish state during that time. So, um, you'd be like, what it, who cares? This isn't New Testament stuff. It is, actually. This stuff is still going on in the time of the, of the writing of the New Testament. The Sadducees and the Pharisees come out of, movements come out of this time period. Not only that, but actually in John, it talks about how Jesus in John chapter 10 goes up and talks about, I am the light of the world during the, fe the Feast of Dedication. The Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah. It is this feast that happened during this time. All of this is the backdrop to the, New Test the writing of the New Testament. But the thing that probably shapes the New Testament writing, the, the era of the New Testament more than anything else, is what happened in 63 B.C. The Romans had 
steadily been increasing in their power. In 63 BC, a Roman general by the name of Pompey comes in and conquers Jerusalem. And does something very odd. He rides his horse into the temple, sets up a statue to Zeus, and sacrifices a pig on the altar of the temple. Exactly the kind of thing that Antiochus IV Epiphanes had done several, uh, about a hundred years before that led to the revolt to begin with. Instead, this time, it squashed any revolt. And Rome took over Jerusalem in Israel and kind of renamed it Judea. So in the New Testament, you will hear Judea referred to. That is the Roman name for the region. So the Roman Empire takes control of it and remains in control of it as the Roman Empire until about 313 AD. So the entire New Testament era, they're in control of this area. Now, and then uh, between 6 and 2 BC, um, actually uh, right around 6 BC, um, the first official Roman emperor, uh, who was uh, Augustus, uh, Julius Caesar kind of declared himself emperor, it got him killed, but um, Augustus is the first emperor. He declares the census be taken of the Roman world. That happened in around 6 BC, and it was concluded around 2 BC, so sometime between 6 and 2 BC, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And he is born into a world that is under Roman rule, that has a population of people that have a history of revolting against foreign rulers and know all of the promises that God has made. And they're being ruled not only by Roman rulers in some other land, but the Romans actually set up um, this what we call Idumean king or dynasty of Herod. Herod is the first, Herod the Great, and then um, Herod Antipas and then his, his children. They rule as local kings, but under Roman rule. The Romans are in charge of them. And it's during this time, this 500, actually almost 600 year period, that God's people are eagerly waited for God to fulfill his covenant promises. All of the ones that we've talked about. They're saying, surely God is going to re- uh, is going to do everything that he's promised, including restore Israel. If you read the Gospels and you don't have this backdrop of this is what was going on, there's a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense. Why doesn't Jesus just come out and say, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one you've been waiting for, because they would have been like, great, kill the Romans. Come on, let's do what the Maccabees did. And he was like, we're not doing that. They had a history of this. This was, this was, Jesus wasn't born into a vacuum. But what we are going to focus on is specifically what Jesus does as the one who fulfills God's promises. And just to give you kind of a brief outline of what we're going to do today, and then um, today and in two weeks and then in three weeks, we are going to finish this series over um, in three sermons, today and two more sermons after today. Today we are going to look at the role that Jesus has as the fulfiller of those covenant promises in his first coming. Next, uh, in two weeks from today, we are going to look at the church's role as that covenant community that he establishes and what is our role in the covenant now. And then we're going to look at how all the covenants will find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ's return in a few weeks. And in that process, we're going to cover the whole New Testament. The New Testament covers, obviously, the life of Jesus, but even in, in the writings of the New Testament, it's making sense of the life of Jesus, and then how do we apply that life. So we are going to start by talking about how in the person, uh, it should say person and work of Jesus, we see all of God's covenantal promises find their fulfillment. And what we mean by fulfillment here is when God says he would do something, Jesus came to do it. And sometimes fulfillment means I did what God said, that's done now. And other times it was I am doing what God said he would do and that's going to continue. But I'm the one that it's going to get done through. 
And so we're going to look at each of the covenants we've talked about thus far and see how Jesus is the fulfillment of that, starting with the God's promise to Adam. Now, Adam, remember the promise that God made to Adam and Eve was that an offspring of Eve would de will defeat the power of the serpent, of the devil, of evil, of sin. Since uh, this, is, this is how the author, uh, by the way, we're going to look at the book of Hebrews a lot today because the author of Hebrews is very concerned with covenant. And so he keeps saying, let's look at the covenants and how Jesus is that fulfillment of them. This is what the author of Hebrews says. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, that is Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the, their fear of death. Jesus came to defeat the devil, the serpent. But not only does he do that, he does something greater than that. Jesus actually takes the place of Adam. By defeating sin and death and replacing it with righteousness and life. The New Testament authors refer to Jesus in multiple ways, especially Paul, but it's more than just in Paul, as a second or sometimes the last Adam. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5. He says, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, that is Adam, the many were made sinners, all of humanity. So also through the obedience of the one man, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the second Adam. What does that mean? Well, in a nutshell, it means this. God created Adam to be a perfect being that would perfectly obey. He represented all of humanity, and he failed to obey. Jesus, the God-man, comes, and as a perfect human, without sin, succeeds where Adam failed. Think of how many times in the New Testament the expression born again or born anew or born from above or something of that variation comes about. What does it mean? It means that we experience this regeneration through, when we trust in the person and the work of Jesus. We experience this regeneration and our identity changes. We go from being a child of Adam, a child of sin and disobedience, to a child of God. And no longer are we defined by that sin and disobedience, but instead we're defined by the obedience of Jesus, by the righteousness of Christ. We have been adopted into God's family. In the, in the covenant that God made with Noah, God shows how he will deal with sin through both judgment and mercy. And Jesus does that in two ways. Actually, well, in two ways, yes. First, Jesus is the rightful judge of humanity. We're told that in Scripture. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, when, when uh, Paul is relating um, the gospel to Cornelius and then to others. It says, Jesus commanded us to preach the, to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Why Jesus? Because he is both God and man, he understands what humanity goes through, and so he is a, a good judge. He, he knows what we're going through. But he is also our merciful high priest. The high priest is the one who stands between God and humanity. And if you remember in the Old Testament system, the Mosaic Law, the high priest's job was to represent the people to God, not God to the people. That's an important distinction. 
That's what Jesus does. He represents us before God. He is the merciful high priest who understands our struggles because of his incarnation. Again, the author of Hebrews says this very clearly. He says, for this reason, he, that is Jesus, had to be made like them, that is his brothers, us, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. In 4.15, he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus comes to show God's mercy and judgment. And on the cross, those two things meet. The judgment we deserve is doled out to Jesus, and we receive mercy instead. The Noahic covenant sees its fulfillment in the person of Christ. And when Christ returns, when we talk about that, we'll talk about how that final judgment will be seen as well through Jesus. The promise that God made to Abraham was that God had chosen a family through which to bring the Redeemer who will bless all of humanity. Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, came as that Redeemer. Galatians 3.14 tells us he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. If you read Matthew 1.1, the very beginning of the book of Matthew, it's a genealogy and it talks about this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Adam, the son of God. He is the son of Abraham. He is a child of Abraham. He is the promised seed. If you remember the Abrahamic covenant, God said, and through your seed, through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. The word seed there is singular. Through one person who will come from your line, all nations, and the word nation in the New Testament is the word Gentile. It is the same word. Jesus came that everyone would receive the blessing that God wanted to pour out through Abraham. He is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And this is where it gets a little more complicated. Because thus far, all of the covenants we've talked about, the Adamic covenant still has effect, still going on. The, the Noahic covenant still going on. The Abrahamic covenant still going on. And then we come to the covenant that God made with Moses. God specifies that a people, uh, specifies a people to bring his blessing through and gives them the job of representing him. Jesus comes as that perfect representative of God. He is, to use the Old Testament language, he is the perfect Israel. He is everything that Israel was meant to be. The New Testament authors say this very clearly, and, and, and sometimes even Matthew talks about when Jesus goes down to Egypt when he's a child, and it says, this is to fulfill what was written in the prophets. Out of Egypt I have called my son. If you read in the prophets, that's not a reference to Jesus. It's a reference to Israel. But Jesus is that fulfillment. He is that perfect. He is everything Israel was meant to be. He is the perfect representative of God. Again, in Hebrews you can also look in Colossians and talks about this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He is the perfect representative of God. When we have seen Jesus, we have seen God. We'll talk next, uh, in a couple weeks actually, because we have... Um, uh, uh, sharing time next week, but in a couple weeks we'll talk about how do we as, God, as, as the church, how do we represent Jesus to the world. He also perfectly fulfilled the requirements of the Mosaic Law, thus ending that aspect of the covenant. Now, this is where a, a lot of times it gets a little tricky. Uh, 
But the New Testament is very clear about this. Jesus was very clear about this by saying, listen, there are things that the Old Testament, um, the, the Old Covenant, and this is a reference to the Mosaic Covenant, specifically the law. Think about the law and the, the legal, the, the, those aspects of the covenant, like what, what is required of Israel to do. Jesus came and said, I will take care of that, and I'm going to put that to an end. And often we'll read what Jesus said, like in Matthew 5, 17 and 18 here, and misunderstand what he's saying. By Some people will say, no, 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 that covenant is still in effect. It has to be. Jesus explicitly says, no, it's not. And we will read a text like this and say, but it says here that they won't go away. No, that's not what it says. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Jesus didn't come to abolish them. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And then on the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. That is what he's referring to. I have accomplished what was required. Jesus isn't saying the law is going to be in effect for all of eternity. He's saying actually the opposite. He's saying, listen, we're not going to just pretend it doesn't exist. He's saying, I've come to deal with it, fulfill it, and end it. And it's ended. It's done. The law is no longer in effect for anyone. It's done. Now, um, in, the, in the class we're doing on Wednesday nights, um, the, the How to Read the Bible class, we're actually doing a section on the law. You want to get into that a little bit deeper, I'd highly recommend that you watch the video that we posted on Wednesday about this because it goes into how do we as New Testament believers read and understand the Old Testament law, what is our role in interaction with that law. And We talk about that in great depth that we don't have time to get into today in that. But we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Um, but the short form of that is that Jesus came to fulfill it. And what is fulfilled, what is accomplished, then gets set aside. So the law has been fulfilled in Jesus. Then we come to David. God indicated to David that his promised redeemer specifically would be a king from David's line. That king is known as the Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus is that. He is the Messiah, the promised Davidic descendant that was promised to be the eternal king. The Greek word for Messiah is the word Christ. When we say Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name, it is his title. He is the promised Davidic king. He is the fulfillment of God's promise to David. He is the anointed one of God. Again, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says, This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes on. I have listed there just from the Gospels, just the Gospels, not the rest of the New Testament, just the Gospels, the references that are made to Jesus being the son of David. Tying Jesus to David. That's just from the Gospels. And you'll notice Matthew overwhelmingly wants to make that point because he's writing to a Jewish audience that that would be very important to. Mark and Luke have that as well. John only has one reference. John only has one reference. And actually, John's reference is a little interesting. He actually asks the people, uh, the teachers of the law, he says, who do you say the Messiah is? Whose son? And they say, well, he's the son of David. And Jesus says, great. Let me ask you this. How is it that David, writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, calls him Lord? He's not denying that he's a Davidic son. He's saying, yes, he is, but somehow this son is greater than David was. In fact, he calls him God. And Jesus is claiming that title for himself 
but John writes from a different point of view. He's not making the point that Jesus is the Davidic king in, in such a, a direct way. He's doing it in a more indirect way. We might spend some time in John later on this year and look at some of that. Which brings us to the last part of this, which is what we talked about a few weeks ago. The promise of something new. Through the prophet Jeremiah and others, God promised to establish a new covenant where he would dwell within his people. And he would do so, we're told, by dealing with our sin. Jesus is the one that establishes this new covenant through his sacrificial death and resurrection. He deals with our sin so that we might receive his spirit for God to dwell with us. Again, the book of Hebrews. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is having his, his last meal with his disciples, he says he ta- it says, he, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup. This is part of what we know as the Lord's Supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Through Jesus' blood, this new covenant has been established. And with the establishment of the new covenant, the Mosaic covenant was put to rest. It was finished. It wasn't abandoned. It was completed. The author of Hebrews makes this very clear. He says, but in, this, uh, in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. And you might say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Aren't the promises in the Old Testament good? Like, did God mess them up? No, the old promises were great. But there was an aspect of the old promise that relied on the faithfulness of the people. The new covenant does not rely on the faithfulness of the people, but only on the faithfulness of Jesus as both God and man. He upholds both parts of the covenant. But God found fault with the people. And said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel, with the people of Judah. That's a direct quote from Jeremiah. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. He's not saying that there was anything broken with the first covenant, except for one of the parties, the people. And so God said, I will send my son as a human, to uphold your end of the deal. And now that covenant is fulfilled, and I'm going to establish a new covenant. Again, in the class that we're doing on Wednesday, I I talked about this in this class, but the covenant that the Mosaic covenant explicitly is what is known as a suzerain covenant, is the kind of covenant that is established between a monarch and his subjects. The subjects kept failing, so Jesus said, I'll fulfill that. I'll take on their role, and I'll fulfill that. The new covenant is not a suzerain covenant. It's a familial covenant. We are not called to be under God in a way of saying, you're the king and we are your subjects. Instead, the the language of the new covenant is, I am your father and you are my children. And I I don't disown my children. When you're faithless, I'm faithful to you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. In fact, I'm going to come and dwell in you so that you can actually be really faithful. So you can be everything I intended you to be. Jesus came to establish this new covenant, and it's that covenant that we live under. I've said this before, but we have, in the the Bible, we have two sections, right? We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Funny thing is, the word testament isn't the language used in the Bible. The word testament is the word covenant. Literally, we have the old covenant and the new covenant. And I'm not saying that the old covenant, meaning everything, Adam, 
um, Noah, Abraham, that those are all done. No, they're not. Just the Mosaic one. Because all of the rest of those covenants didn't have to do with every, all the rest of the covenants were, were more large scale. The Mosaic covenant was just about Israel and God and what their role was. And, and Jesus said, I've come to, 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 to do that work for you, to do that job for you. And I'm going to establish a new covenant with you. And not just Israel, but people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Because that was actually the call that Abraham had received. That was the call that goes all the way back to Adam. In fact, if you read through the gospel accounts, I said that Matthew makes it very clear that Jesus is the son of Abraham because that's what is important to Jews, that he's Abrahamic. Luke, in Luke 3, when it talks about here's the genealogy of Jesus, Abraham's mentioned, but that's not where it ends. It ends with Adam. Luke wrote to Gentiles, not to Jews. If you're not Jewish, Abraham doesn't mean much to you. But we all come from Adam. And Luke is trying to show that Jesus is here for all of us. Every single one of us. Son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise that God has made. As the New Testament authors say, in Jesus, all of God's promises are yes and amen. They find their fulfillment in him. So what is our so, our so what? Since Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises, that makes him the perfect covenant maker and keeper. Like I said, the failure in the part of the Mosaic Covenant wasn't with God. It was with people. And Jesus, God, and God said, there's no way you guys can be faithful to me. In fact, that is actually, we're told, the purpose of the whole point of the law. The major point that God, reason God gave Israel the law was to say, I want you to look different than the world around me, or around you. I want you to look like me. So live like this and you'll look more like me. And then they kept failing to do it. And God said, yes, because you are trying to live like me without me. You can't live godly without me. You can't fulfill the law. You cannot do it. No human being in all of history can do it. Why? Because Adam messed it up for all of us. So what does God do? He says, I'm going to bring about a new Adam still of your lineage, but without the sin. And he will succeed where you have all failed. And he will fulfill your end of the deal. And now that that's done, now you're adopted into the family of God as children, as heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We are now the family of God. That is the New Testament language. We are God's children. And he said, I want to put my spirit inside of you so you'll look like your dad, so you'll look like your big brother. And because Jesus is the one who made that promise and he has shown himself faithful, the one who has began this good work in us We'll see it to completion. Why? Because he's he, every time he said he would do something, he's done it. And the things that he has promised that haven't come to completion, well, we're going to get to that because G- Scripture tells us that Jesus will do those things too. So even when we talk about what is the role of the church in all of this, what do we do? Well, how do we? How are we part of this covenant? How do we represent God to the world? Even as we do that, we are told we only can do that, how? Through the power of the Holy Spirit of God with us, Emmanuel, dwelling within us. We can't be God's covenant people without God's indwelling spirit. Why? Because 
They couldn't do it before. We can't do it now. So the question is, do we trust him to be all that God has promised? And are we telling others of our faithful God and inviting them into this family? We'll talk about this more in the weeks to come. What is our role in this? This is our meditation verse for today. It's Galatians 4, 4 through 5. Um, Dick, I'm going to ask Dick to come up. He's going to lead us in a time of prayer. It says, but when this, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Born of a woman, Adam, Adamic covenant. Born under the law, Mosaic covenant. Why? So that we might become sons and daughters, adopted.